be confident that what you're going to say is okay. You don't have to conform to other people's demands or expectations. And am I hungry? Am I angry? Am I lonely? Or am I tired? And it's called halt. And sometimes people um, can unfortunately be a trigger for difficult drinking. Hello and welcome to Perspectives, a new series from Priory where we bring together panels of experts to talk about the big issues in mental health and addictions today. I'm Colin Quick and I'm the Chief Quality Officer for Priory and today we're going to be talking about issues around maintaining sobriety or cutting down your drinking over the winter period. Now on the panel today I'm joined by Dr Donald Massey, one of our consultant psychiatrists, also by Debbie Longsdale, our Director of Therapies, and finally by Dr David McLaughlin, a consultant psychiatrist and co-founder of Curb. Welcome everyone. So let's just start off with the first question and I think it's a really open and, and broad one to start with and, and Debbie I'm going to come to you first with this. What do you see as the, the challenges around this time of year for people and thinking about drinking? I think it's a really huge topic and it's really complicated and I think there's so many expectations, there are so many um, family dynamics that play in, there are so many um, historic kind of uh, parties or you should or you must. There's lots of rules I think around that people don't necessarily connect with that unconsciously people then respond to. So I think it needs quite a lot of careful thinking around how people respond. And, uh, Donna, from your point of view, how does that work for people that maybe have had difficulties with drinking in the past, maybe in recovery? How does that, how does that differ for them, do you think? In terms of Christmas time? Yeah. It's challenging because Christmas is a festive period and in the UK it typically involves parties, which are often at restaurants or pubs, and alcohol is usually front and centre to a lot of the festivities. It's very difficult for one who's had difficulties with drinking to completely abstain when, when it's expected that one is part of the fun if only if one is drinking. Okay, that's pretty useful. Uh, David, let's bring you into this. Uh, what's your view? I mean, when you've got people who are just thinking about how do I cut down? What's some of those sort of tactics that you think people could start using? We'll dive into a bit more later on a few more of those real detailed scenarios, but what are those sort of high level things that people could think about? Yeah, so I, th I think one of the things that's really helpful for people who are looking to cut down on their drinking is to first kind of gain a sense of awareness of how much are you actually drinking just now? And what are the, the cues or triggers that lead you to drink? Um, and I guess bring a sense of awareness as to what alcohol is giving you, but also what it's taking away from you. Um, so if whenever I work with my patients in clinic um, or with uh, end users of, of the app curb, one of the first things that we do is, is to kind of, kind of as a baseline, get a sense of where people are, how much are you drinking right now and what is your relationship? And then that's where we start. Thank you. And, and uh, do we want to come to you about this? It's about, I guess it's that view um, from your perspective, when when does that drinking become harmful? When does it become something that's a challenge that actually over that period that people and loved ones of, of, of people who might have some problem drinking or challenges around it, what's the sort of things that people need to be looking out for? Gosh, that can be so far winding, far reaching, can't it? I mean, I guess everybody's tolerance to alcohol is different. That's something to bear in mind biologically. Um, and your relationship with the alcohol is also quite complex in terms of your family dynamics or in terms of whether you're using it as a coping mechanism for other things. Is it, is it a cover up or are you using it as a social leisure and that's OK, you've got a good handle on it. So I think it becomes a problem when you feel you don't have a choice or when you're leaning on it maybe at the wrong time of day or when you know that psychologically you're not coping and you can see the link then in hindsight with that chain reaction that you've gone to alcohol to help you stabilise or, or, or respond to something. Um, and I think we have to also consider the effect it has on other people. Um, so um, if your alcohol then is causing problems in relationships or in families, that also needs talking about as well because people will have perceptions or expectations maybe in, in relationships. So I think a really wide um, 
honest conversation around your relationship with alcohol and the permission in a family or in a relationship to talk about that and what that means to you and to me and to the impact it's having on my children and what they've been talking about at school and giving them permission to talk about what they've heard and, and having an open conversation about it. I think that's that's the best framework, I guess, for, for that for that kind of platform of conversation. Now, I guess throughout the Christmas season, there's always going to be some real sort of challenge points as well. Donnie, you mentioned about parties and events and things. And one of those big ticket days is, is Christmas Day. So what sort of things, what are those challenges at Christmas time, and particularly on Christmas Day? Um, how can people think about almost preparing themselves for that? So, Donald, what do you think? Mm, so I think as a, as a child, um, Christmas was about presents and fun. Thinking about family Christmas lunch and dinners now, it's often about indulgence. Mm. So indulging in gift giving, but also indulging in, in food, in, in, in merriment. So I'm, want, I'm thinking maybe part of it is a potential act of communication with others who are going to be there on the day saying, actually, I, this is a difficulty which I have, and I need to be mindful of how much I'm consuming. That's potentially a start, but I'd like to hear what maybe others think on that. Debbie, what about yourself? Yeah, I think indulgence is a really interesting word. I'm just going back again to, to my kind of family kind of history, and you've got sherry, and you've got champagne, and you've got the the orange juice with the champagne and you've got what you're going to have to drink with dinner and then what you're going to have to eat in the evening and food and drink is huge that time of year and that particular day isn't it so mm. i think it's taking a step back and thinking am i what choice do i have do i want to engage in this in that way that people have perhaps done historically how does that make me feel is that good for me and i think it's it's just having some preparation time to think how do I want to engage with that day when I know that all these unconscious and conscious pressures are around and then make a plan. I think mm. planning is really important for people. Mm. And David, from your point of view, what would that plan look like? What do you think people want to think about to prepare? Yeah, I, I really like that actually, um, about having a plan and, and, and however you choose to engage with alcohol or not engage with alcohol on Christmas day or your Christmas party, it's all about doing so with intent. And, and having a plan, um, because if you if you have a plan, you're you're not going to go on autopilot. You're less likely to be <coughs> pressured into drinking when you don't want to drink or drink more than you intend to drink. Um, so I think I think that his point there actually is is, is is invaluable. It's all about having uh, a plan and and ha and drinking with an, if you're going to drink, drink with intention. Um, and if you don't want to drink, then have a plan and have a strategy of how you're going to either avoid <coughs> either avoid or manage those drinking cues and triggers. Brilliant, thank you. Now, one of the, the sort of, I think is quite a thorny area is around families, because in amongst all this, we have that person who might be, have difficulties with, with their alcohol use, but surrounding them often is a family. Uh, and whatever that family looks like with the extended family, the immediate family. And it's often very challenging for them because they see their, their family member going through some really difficult times. And I would really kind of welcome thoughts around, I guess one of those things is, one, what can the family do to help? And two, who can help the family as well? And I think that's going to be something for, for all of you, but I'm going to start with Debbie around that. Yeah, huge topic. Um, <clears throat> and I think it needs some careful thinking because people might feel really um, responsive to somebody who's drinking in a room and let's say there's 10 people in the room and, and Uncle Joe is just drinking too much and off he goes again. And you might feel that you want to speak to him there and then. I would predict probably that wouldn't end well if you ask him in front of everybody else and while well, he's having a drink. So I think it's it's clocking that you've got an issue with somebody and you want to talk to them and then thinking when would be a good time to do that. And I would suggest that we do that when they're not drinking or when they're on their own and having a quiet word with somebody and just sharing your concerns. Um, <clears throat> um, and I think that, um, you know, you might find it helpful to talk to somebody else in the family and see if... What, here's what I'm seeing, what do you think about it? Maybe just checking your understanding. If you're being sensitive to something, it's worth just talking that through with somebody. Um, and it might be quite a shock for that person to hear that you've got concerns about them. So 
um, you know, that kind of um, idea that they might embrace your thoughts with open arms and you've saved me. I've been waiting for someone to ask me this question. It might not be the case. So, um, you know, I think it's it's a very delicate topic and, and it can open up a whole um, complicated uh, response. So it's being really careful about how you choose your words, being very, um, very, very kind of non-judgmental about it because, you know, that person may just need some space to be accepted in, in what they say um, and, and just carefully choose your timing. Mm, okay. Donald, your view, the family challenge. Um, it, I'm going to jump off from, from what you said. So difficult for fam members of the family to broach the topic and um, difficult to address it head on, particularly if the individual has a difficult relationship with drinking, doesn't feel it is a problem. Um, I want to maybe take a slightly different tack, which is um, particularly for maybe young people in the family, how do they address such a problem with an elder? Mm. And that can be really, really tough because first of all, how, can you, how, dare, how dare you question um, somebody who is your parent um, or grandparent or otherwise? But it, again, it's ultimately about care. If, and if you, if you care for somebody, you want the best for them, it's important to call out um, unhealthy habits to think about because if not, there are possibly very negative consequences um, to one's health, to one's well-being, to one's even employment. And it's really important for loved ones to actually broach it. Perhaps more, more difficult when we're talking about people who are very young, say of, of school age, in which it may be difficult to, to speak to the adult who is always drunk, particularly if when they are drunk they are angry, they're abusive. So really, really important then to speak to, if you're in school, um, teachers or aunts, uncles, grandparents, so that you can be supported. It's not just you who is approaching the topic. Because it's very easy if you're living in the house with somebody to feel responsible for them, um, to not to, to, to be feel shame as well, not just for them because it's part of the family that, and talking about it could put the family's name in jeopardy. Um, so that's one aspect. A slightly different topic which came to mind earlier was in terms of triggers, David, you mentioned people, mm -hmm. and sometimes people um, can unfortunately be a trigger for difficult drinking. So it may be that when Uncle Fester, I think the Adams family is around, mm -hmm. um, um, mum or dad will often drink more because of issues within that relationship. Mm -hmm. um, and again, that's worth acknowledging because mum and dad may not be aware of exactly what they're doing. Thank you. Uh, I want to go this for everyone. So, David, your your views, because you must see that in your clinical practice, the the challenges between family members and that dynamics and the issues that surround that. What 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 would be your advice about how to go about supporting someone? Yeah, and I, I've actually had in my clinical practice, I've I've had family members coming to me as a addiction psychiatrist asking me this exact question: How do I bring up this subject with my husband, my brother, my, my, my daughter. And it's, it's, this is a really, really difficult um, conversation to have to have. And people are often frightened or scared to have this conversation. They're often off, they're also, they can also be angry um, or feel let down um, or feel ashamed. There's, there's all sorts of diff difficult emotions. Um, I think Debbie mentioned a really great point there about picking the time to have this conversation. Um, and also, again, being really mindful, being aware of how you're feeling. Because if you yourself, as a family member, are kind of feeling very angry um, or emotionally charged, maybe this is not the best time to have the conversation. Um, I think also it's a lot to carry on your shoulders alone. So there's a lot of family members feel that this is it's up to them to deal with this and they have nobody else to turn to. So there are some amazing charities, um, Alcohol Change UK, ADFAM is another charity specifically for the family members, people who have addiction. Um, or of course you can come to a service like the Priory and you can speak to somebody like us and, and, and get some advice. Um, but yeah, I think, I think thinking about the timing of the conversation, how are you feeling yourself when you have that conversation? Um, and I would also, I'd, you know, encourage you to try, try, I know it's difficult, but approach that conversation with a real sense of empathy. 
you know, why why is it that this person is drinking so much? What's what's driving them to drink so much? It could be things like insomnia, it might be anxiety, and um, they might be really low and depressed, and maybe that's a way into the conversation to start to start that conversation from a from a place of of empathy and, and support. Um and try if you can not to be judgmental. And like Debbie said, just notice your language. You might even want to practice or rehearse this conversation with mm. a friend. Um, just to make sure that you're not coming across being judgmental or blaming uh, or being too inflammatory um, and placing fault. Because I think that can be very, that makes the conversation really, really difficult and could push them further away and drive, drive the, the family member that you care about away. Um, and then one last thing, I know I've spoken for a while on this. Do you know something that I think works really well is also talking about the positives. So telling the person how much you enjoy spending time with them when they're sober and what you like about them, about when there isn't alcohol around and all the mm. things that you get to do and the conversations that you have and the things you get to enjoy together when there's no alcohol. So as well as kind of having that difficult conversation, maybe maybe ending with something positive so that they, they leave that conversation feeling good about themselves. Okay. Now, one of the things that that's really strikes me in this, and, and, and Donna, I want to bring back to a point that you mentioned, was about, it's about festivity, it's about fun, it's about parties. But actually, Christmas time is one of those really difficult times for people when they can feel lonely and isolated mm. and actually they don't have that kind of social network that sits there and you know, you can be sitting at your own at home and, and that's a really challenging time. And I guess for me that one of those is where do people then reach out for a drink? How do they reach out mm. for that comfort that's there? And people gain comfort in lots of different ways, food, drink, all sorts of things. So what's thinking sort of taking back from where people might be using alcohol, but what, what's mm. those sort of things that people can do just around managing their own feelings of loneliness or how could people reach out and do different things? Maybe the first really important step is acknowledgement. Mm. Acknowledging that actually I feel sad, I feel lonely because of particular factors such as isolation or maybe the loss of a loved one. And Christmas can be a, re a real stark reminder of, of loss. If it was previously, re uh, previously related to fun and merriment and that, that person or people are not around anymore for various reasons. Mm. Um, it's easy to dig, dig, one, dig one's head in the sand or drown oneself with, with alcohol. So then how to, how to manage that, um, be in touch with the feelings, reach out to loved ones even if they are at a distance, mm. and also remember that although Christmas can be a reminder, it is just, it is just a day. Um, there's also potential religious arguments, which is again primarily it's seen as a religious festivity for Christians and other um, people, less so now in our secular, secular culture. But again, if one is religious, it can be an opportunity to re-engage with, with that aspect of, of oneself. And if one isn't, you can say actually it is, it is just a day. Mm. And it's really important to think about that, isn't it? It's that that day, that one day in the 365 mm. days of the year and that challenge that that brings. And, and I guess that's that's an interesting one for me when we talk about that, the loneliness and the and the isolation piece. And, and David, is that something that you see in your clinical practice? Do you see that direct linkage between people's problem drinking and that area of loneliness? Yeah, yeah I, love, I love the fact that you brought up loneliness because there's a really great tool that I ask people to, to use every time they are reaching out for a drink. And I asked them to think, why, why am I having this drink? Um, what, what purpose is this drink serving for me? And am I hungry? Am I angry? Am I lonely? Or am I tired? And it's called HALT. So it's a way of um, just pausing and stopping, um, not going into autopilot, and just thinking for a second, what purpose is this drink serving for me? What is it actually doing for me? Is it because I'm hungry? Am I angry? Am I lonely? Am I tired? And actually, is there a better way of fulfilling that need rather than having a drink? Which is fascinating, isn't it, about how people can find those other coping mechanisms, those other ways of doing things. And I think that's a really, again, it's really interesting in terms of that, almost that perceived stress that's caused by Christmas. And whilst we'll, we'll talk more about the sort of alcohol elements later on, Debbie, from, again, from your point of view and your clinical practice, what's the sort of things that you see about helping and supporting people to manage their, their stress levels around it? Because a crowded household mm. or a completely isolated household 
have their different types of stress, but they can still feel very difficult for people. Yeah, I think a level of self-awareness is really important. And I think it's, it's um, we have to acknowledge as clinicians, it's actually quite, we're asking people to be quite brave to acknowledge what really is going on. Like you say, you know, what is the purpose of that drink or why are you doing what you're doing? Why are you choosing to do that? And I think to allow yourself to acknowledge that you're stressed or that you're lonely is actually probably quite a big ask for some people to do. So I think we should kind of acknowledge that as well. Um, and then once you know that you're stressed, so that could be things like, do I scale it from naught to 10? Where am I on a, on a, on a sort of a, a scale with 10 being really stressed? And that can be a really helpful. In fact, I had a patient this week we did that with where we just thought about the scale and actually I'm a, I'm a five, I'm a six, I'm a seven. Okay, what do you do when you're a seven? What kind of coping strategies do you lean on? And, and one of those could be alcohol because actually you don't know what else to do and therefore that's a way of zoning out or switching off or disappearing. It could be any anything that it means for you. So I think starting to understand your stress levels and if I am lonely, what can I do about that? And what are my options and what are my coping skills? It's a really um, psychological awareness. We'll go into the whole therapy world. I'm not careful, but um, you know, I think just being able to connect with what's going on for you is just so important for people. Thanks. I mean, I think we've all got to that point in the discussion around actually Christmas can be difficult. It can be brilliant. Let's not negate that at mm. all. But it can be yeah. difficult for people at different times. And I think one of those bits for me. I want to bring us back to that the topic today, which is around people with with maybe problematic alcohol use over that time or what might be perceived as it. Um, so, and I wanted to talk about those that may be in recovery as well, because that's a really, really, you know, really important group that we think about. And, and Donald, we'd love to hear your views about for those that have had those challenges in the past um, with alcohol use, what, what can they do over the Christmas period? What are those things that we might want to reinforce around messages around good things to be done? We talked about sort of planning mm. earlier on, but mm. For that particular group, is there something that they could do? So structure and routine can be very, very important. So I know many um, people in recovery who, even though they've been dry for 10, 20 years, they will still attend very frequent AA meetings. Mm -hmm. Or they'll have con really good contacts with a sponsor or a peer who has similar difficulties. So in terms of structure, have bolstering that, that support network could be very important in a high stress time such as Christmas. And although we're talking about Christmas, I think the whole of December really can can fit into that category. So it's out there, isn't it? It's that yeah. support that's available. And I guess that's part of that planning that we talked about earlier on, yeah. which is knowing where those meetings are, knowing mm. how you can reach out for that support during those difficult times. And I guess one of those things for me as well, we talked about, um, and David, you referenced it earlier on, about those that drink or those that don't want to drink or those that want to cut down mm. over those periods. For those that have had a challenge with drinking before, or those that are um, thinking about actually they may be and I want to manage this, what's the sort of things about how they can manage any sort of relapses during that time? I think 85% of people who quit drinking alcohol will have a relapse within the following 12 months. So it's really, really common. I think what's important is to have a relapse prevention plan so that it doesn't happen in the first place but if it does happen it doesn't have to be the end of the world it doesn't have to you don't have to um kind of throw all that hard work away that you've done you can actually pull it back so it's about catching it early um and not not seeing this as an opportunity to sabotage and to throw all of that work out the window so if you do relapse it happens, it's okay, don't beat yourself up about it. Um, maybe get back in touch with um, your therapist, speak to family and friends, um, and go back to all of the work that you've done before with your relapse prevention plan. And this is actually a learning opportunity. This is a chance to think, why did this happen? How did this happen? And how am I gonna do things differently next time? That's really helpful, thank you. Now, one of the common things again as we've been talking things through is about how do we support or how can someone support themselves when they might be relapsing or about to relapse and all of you have talked about planning being absolutely key and, and Donald I'd like to come to you we talk a lot about relapse prevention plans and that's a very sort of clinical focus but that's something that is owned by the individual 
for you, what would a good relapse prevention plan look like? So a few elements come to mind. Um, one would be identifying um, your specific triggers. I de so what, what facts, what situations lead you to, um, to pick up a bottle or to go, go, or to go on a binge? Who would you want to s reach out to or contact so for support if you are struggling, either before picking a bottle or during the course of one? Um, what mech, what could be useful for um, managing your ongoing recovery, which isn't quite the right words. I'm thinking about access to means to buy the alcohol. Um, is it better to hand over um, cards to, um, to, to loved ones, delete the apps from your phone? I think it's really important to, whatever the plan is, to write it down. Um, so it's a, it's a record for yourself. You can go to it rather than sitting down and ruminating about what am I going to do next? And also sharing it with with loved ones who could support you with it. Um, so I guess the key elements would be, what are the, what are the triggers? What are the individualized solutions? What are the specific specific solutions for you? Who do you need to support? Who, which support do you need to action that? And put it in writing, and share it. I think that's something we do a mm. lot in in therapy with, with with that topic as well. So you and you can Google it and you can find loads of resources where actually you write your plan. And so you say, I feel good when I do this, or I feel good when I speak to this person, or mm. I feel good when I get up at, you know, 6.30 in the morning, or it might be 10 o'clock in the morning, whatever it may be for you, but you've got a bit of a, I feel good when kind of document that you can lean on. And also if you feel that you might relapse, we might ask people to say, again, in writing, like you say, I'm doing this because, I'm doing it because I want to be healthy. Mm -hmm. I'm doing it because I want to be looking after my children more. I do it because, I want to take control of my life. Whatever it may, may, whatever somebody has said that the reason for doing it is really important that we reconnect with that when people start to go downhill because you need to connect with why you're here in the first place. And and it's having because and we all know when you're under stress and when you're um, feeling low, it's very difficult to connect with those positive thoughts about why you even wanted to do all this in the first place. So. Um, the gratitude list, that the plan, that the reasons that I'm doing it, they're really important to go back and reread because that will get, get you back on track and you'll hear again your own voice saying, here's why I'm doing it and here's how I'm going to help myself get back on, on track. So I think writing it down is really mm. important. And one of the things I've heard from all three of you so far is, is the word triggers. And I guess for me, it's, it's an, and for obvious, it's about understanding what that means. And I'd like to come to yourself in a second, David, which is, you know, what is a, what is a trigger? How does someone identify it? And how do they, how do they help manage it? Yeah. <clears throat> um, so triggers or drinking cues, um, we, all, we all have them. Um, and it's unique for every individual. Um, so conce I conceptualize that they can be external triggers or they can be internal triggers. So the internal triggers might be things like emotions. Um, so some people drink when they're excited um, or when they are wanting to enhance a positive experience, but it can also be an internal trigger that's a bit more negative. It could be like sadness, loneliness, anxiety, maybe in social situations. Um, there's internal um, emotions that drive the drinking behavior. Um, but then I also think about the external triggers and the external triggers can be certain places um, so it could be drinking venues or pubs but it could even be things like airports if you associate kind of flying at the airport with with alcohol or train stations um, it could be your friend's house dinner parties it could be uh, so as well as places it can be also times as well so I've got patients where um, children's bedtime that's that's mm -hmm. wine o'clock um, so there's a certain time of the day, um, 8 p.m., that is associated with having a drink. Um, so places, times, um, certain people can be a trigger as well if you have um, drinking friends. Um, uh, so I think I talked about the internal emotional triggers, external triggers, um, and that can be times, places, people. Um, but for every individual, that's going to be different. Um, and that's what, as kind of clinicians, um, we will work with the individual to understand what does that look like for them and how can we help you to identify those triggers and manage them. And if you can't manage them in the short term, 
what do you need to do to adjust the situation so that you can maybe avoid them in the short term? Brilliant, thank you. And I guess that that almost moves us on that stage. So whilst we've, you know, as a, as a collection of clinicians talking about this, um, we've not got into that kind of huge detail about treatment. We've talked about actually how the person supports themselves, the things that they can do for themselves, the way that they can, because that, which is we all, I think, would understand and accept that's the main thing. Someone gets that right, actually the, everything becomes mm. easier. But sometimes things will be more challenging. And, and uh, Don, if I can come to you, it'd be really useful, I guess, for, for our viewers, just to understand if it does become challenging, what, what sort of treatments are out there? What sort of support would be there for someone who's getting to that much more challenged around their alcohol mm, use mm. and the relationship to their mental health as well. So it's a huge sp spread of different resources. And if, if I can think of a simple cat way of categorising it, one could be those who are physically dependent on alcohol, i.e. they need alcohol on a daily basis in order to function, um, versus those who have perhaps have more of a, a, a binge pattern, which is that they can go without alcohol for several days or several weeks or months, but then when they do drink, they drink to significant excess that puts them at in physical danger um, due to complications of drinking, or situationally there are other risks of being intoxicated, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So if somebody has um, problems of alcohol dependency, so they need alcohol on a daily basis, treatments are, are uh, med medical, the medication, but also psychological, very difficult for somebody to, to stop drinking if they, f if they physically need to have alcohol on board to function. So a real key point of treatment in that case is to support them with, with a detox, which can be at home or it can be in hospital, and that is to manage the withdrawal symptoms um, so that people don't feel a need to drink in order to, to get up, get out of, physically get out of bed in the morning. And then it's a matter of having targeted psychological therapies, talking therapies, to address the underlying reasons why people got into that bad relationship in the first place, i.e. the relationship with, with drinking. For those who um, have more of a, so say, binge pattern, the treatment is going to be largely psychological, which is, go again, as I, as I just said, addressing the underlying reasons why people um, use alcohol as a crutch, use alcohol to self-medicate anxiety, depression, or otherwise, or use alcohol because they, they're bored, they're lonely, etc. So medical, psychological, but also social support friends, family, the wider networks. Mm. And it's really important to have that, that almost that whole picture, isn't it? That actually almost mm. one element will do some part of it, but actually if you've got the medical, the psychological, the social support, it's a much stronger package altogether for that person, mm. isn't it? Now, as part of our, our preparation for this, and, and we actually had um, some questions that came in uh, that we've mm. had. So what I'd like to do is just go around and, and I'm going to come to you first, David, with one of the questions that we've had sent in to us. So, uh, Great. so this was from, from James. Yep. And James asked, what advice would you give on dealing with social pressures to consume alcohol over the holidays? It's a great question. Um, and it's a, very, it's a very real question from James there. Um, so with my patients in my clinic, I often do role plays with them and we do drink refusal skills. Um, so I will pretend to apply pressure to, to James or, or whoever the person in my clinic is. And then I will teach them ways in which to diffuse that situation and get rid of the pressure. Um, and I, I, I talk about the little white lie, the joke, and then the truth. So the little white lie, for example, might be to say, I can't drink tonight because I'm on antibiotics or I'm, I'm, I'm driving. Um, and very easy way to diffuse the, the situation. The, the joke might be, I can't drink because I turn into a gremlin or um, I'm driving home, but I'm, I'm driving Barack Obama home or something ridiculous that, again, distracts the person that's asking you, that's applying that pressure. And then finally, th the truth. Um, and I think that's a totally acceptable thing to, to tell. Um, uh, if somebody's applying pressure to you saying, why aren't you having a drink? Go on, you're being boring, this is dull. You are um, well within your rights to say, I'm not drinking because I don't want to drink. Um, I'm doing something else tomorrow. I have these other things that I want to do. The other thing I also remind <coughs> my patients as well in clinic or uh, even friends and family <laughs> who, who come to me as well, I say, you don't have to give a reason. You can just say, I'm not drinking. I've got, I've got a glass of water here, I'm good. 
put the pressure back on them. Say, why why are you asking me? Why are you putting why are you putting me under pressure to to have a drink? Why is it necessary um, for me to have a drink for your enjoyment? And turn turn the conversation around. Um, but we, I mean, Debbie mentioned talked about um, having a plan, and this is one of those situations where it is really really important to have a plan so that you um, you can just this falls out your mouth. The you know, the white lie, the joke, the truth, um, or even thinking about how you can turn the conversation around and distract them with something else. So Debbie, Sarah wrote in and she said, "Have we got any tips for attending a Christmas party that I don't want to drink at?" So, do you want to go to the party in the first place? I'm thinking so. You have a choice around whether you go or not. But if you're going to go and you don't want to drink, again, it's back to having a game plan. So it's it's thinking. Um, what am I going to say? So I really like those ideas of having what you've just said as well. Um, and I, I think you need to be prepared, but also be confident that what you're going to say is OK. You don't have to conform to other people's demands or expectations. So I think it's having that sense of self and you've made a choice and that's the right choice for me. And I'm going to stick with my plan. And here's what I'm going to say. Um, you may, if you know people quite well at the party, you might want to have a little buddy that maybe just kind of gives you some support. So you might tell your friend that actually, here's my plan. Could you just support me with this? You know, if I if I struggle and someone's putting me under pressure, can you just kind of be my backup person and and help me, um, you know, respond or or have some um, kind of uh, support? Um, so I think it's predicting what people might say to you and then coming up with the responses and also thinking do I need somebody else in the room to help me with this have I done it before so leaning on evidence is really useful if you've done it before and it worked really well or maybe didn't work very well and you want to change what you did last time learn from the experiences so think about um, what's happened well before or what's not happened well before um, and I think it's okay um, if it doesn't go perfectly, so don't be a perfectionist about your plan. So if you, um, not that you want to drink instead, but if you change what you say, that's okay. If the end game is I don't want to drink, then then stick to your guns and, and have that as your response. So the next one is going to be for, you, for yourself, Donald. And, and this is an interesting one, um, and this came in from Kay. And she asked, <coughs> my friends always seem to want to include alcohol in social events, especially at this time of year. Have you got any advice for suggesting how we keep alcohol, uh, sorry, how we keep events alcohol free? At times you feel a sense of shaming from when, from some, when you bring it up. So hello Kay, first of all. So how to have alcohol free events and, and clarifying the question within my own mind. Um, what is fun is what comes to mind. So. People, particularly the younger generation, will equate um, fun to being intoxicated because when I'm intoxicated, I'm able to um, laugh more. My, my thinking is a bit looser. I, I'm, more, I'm more of a social animal, social butterfly. And perhaps without that um, social lubrication, it can be that much more difficult to be present, to be in the moment, which sounds a little bit like maybe some anxiety anxiety about being authentic, being true to oneself. So which go, going back to Kay's original question, how to have an alcohol-free party, if the, if the point of the party is I'm going to be there with my friends, that is what's most important. Mm -hmm. You don't necessarily need an, um, a biological agent. Um, it sounds like a biohazard, doesn't <laughs> apology. <laughs> you don't necessarily need um, a substance to have fun with friends if they are friends, mm -hmm. which is not to question the very nature of the party, but I feel like that's probably the, the key question. And how do you think Kay has that conversation with her friends though, to say, actually, I want, mm. I, I'm finding it difficult, because clearly, you know, that's probably the, the essence of Kay's question here, is that mm. she's finding it difficult to be around alcohol because that's, maybe that's triggering something. Mm. How does Kay have that conversation with her friends? So touching on one of, Debbie's points, which is about learning from experience. Mm. Um, again, I'm going to role play with myself here. Um, so we had a really, we had a really good party before. Um, I don't remember much of that party. Do you? Is that probably because we were all quite drunk and we remember bits of it? But wouldn't it be quite nice to remember more of the night? 
Um, would it be nice to not get into risky situations? Wouldn't it be nice to just relax, not feel pressured by um, each other to get as drunk as possible? Great to be in the moment, great to explore and taste different things, but we could explore and you know, tickle our, our tongues by trying different foods, um, by not necessarily by trying different alcohols and consuming as much of that as possible. Okay. So it's about ch having a different discussion about, again, do we, we don't have to drink to have a good time. So as friends, what else can we do? Fantastic. So our last question, and I think, because I get to choose, I'm coming to David on this one. Um, so the others breathe a sigh of relief. Um, so Ravi's asked, uh, I've tried to cut down a few times, but at this time of year, it can be hard to maintain. Any advice for overcoming setbacks and, and getting back to it? Okay. Um, so Ravi's looking to cut down his drinking, but not necessarily quit drinking. Is that, is that my yes, sounds, yes. From, sounds like? Um, so again, it's all about drinking more mindfully. So bringing this sense of awareness and, atten and intention to your drinking. Um, so when Ravi starts the beginning of his day, I would say to him, ask yourself, is today going to be a drinking day or a non-drinking day? Um, and uh, if it becomes, if it's going to be a drinking day, how many drinks are you going to have? Like if you're going to the work Christmas party tonight, how many drinks do you want to have? And for what purpose are you going to be drinking? Is it to enhance the enjoyment or for social cohesion or social conformity? Or is it because of a coping mechanism? But whatever the reason for driving the drink, how many are you going to have so that you don't get caught off guard and you don't drink more than you want to drink? And if you do find yourself uh, exceeding the number of drinks that you want to have or the number of days that you plan to drink across a week, again, it's just a it's an opportunity to check in with yourself and say what's going on, why is this happening? Um, and then do I need to revisit my, my relapse prevention plan? Um, or I, I sometimes talk about an if and then plan, like if I encounter these triggers or these stimuli or these cues, then this is my plan to manage and deal with, with, with that. Um, but unless you check in with yourself and, and I guess, have that conversation with yourself or your, your therapist, that's when it can spiral out of control. So I think it's it's great that Ravi's asking this question because he's obviously thinking about it. I think it's really hard though, isn't it, to, to say, I'm only going to have two or three drinks tonight and then yeah. other people bring you a drink. Or I think it's a really hard one to, to kind of get a plan together with that one, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, well, I mean, that's so this is a really good point because um, increasingly people are talking about mindful drinking it and it's really mm. mindful drinking is a really popular movement and actually um it's a harm reduction strategy i definitely think it's a positive thing that that mindful drinking exists but for people who have really problematic drinking people who are alcohol dependent mm. it's not going to work for no. you and abstinence is almost always going to be the the the, the right way forward so in in ravi's case I, I don't I don't know I don't know Ravi and it may be that um it may be that he has an okay relationship with alcohol, it's just something that he's being aware of. But for anybody who has a kind of significant history of alcohol dependence or really or if it's been really harmful for you, sometimes the best approach is actually just it's just abstinence. Um and it doesn't have to be a bad thing. There's so many people that live joyous lives without alcohol. I don't know any sober individual or I don't know anybody who's in recovery that reg regrets it. Mm. Everybody always tells me mm, that their lives are so mm. much better mm. without alcohol. Um, so again, but it's, it's great that Ravi's thinking about this and that yeah. it's something that he's aware of that he's having this conversation with himself. And just on that note, I'm mindful of, of alcohol-free alternatives. Mm. So again, many people with recovery will have alcohol-free gin, alcohol-free beers, which can, be see it, which can be tasty, apparently. Yeah. What's your opinion on though? Because I remember speaking to somebody um, who was a doctor, I can't remember where it was now, who said that if someone's been an alcoholic and they're in recovery and they, they want to choose alcohol-free beers, that they wouldn't recommend they do that because actually the brain then is, is thinking that you're drinking alcohol because of the taste, because they, they do a good job making them taste quite similar. Mm. And then it gets confused in terms of the, 
the response that you might have to what you're drinking. Mm. So it's best not even to have the zero alcohol ones. I don't know if you've come across that. I, I haven't. I haven't. No. I, it may come down to a level of um, resilience. So I do know several people in recovery who swear by alcohol-free alternatives. Mm. Um, I, I don't, I, David, you might speak differently, but I don't know of anyone who has, if we say that's been a gateway to a relapse. Right. Okay. I think it's a really great question because there increasingly there are so many alcohol-free alternative beers or gins. Um, in general, I actually think it's a good thing that people have the choice when you go to the pub um, and you know that there's an alcohol-free beer on tap. I think that's great because there's some people who may have chosen an alcoholic beer but actually then choose to have a zero alcohol beer. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's really useful for giving you that sense of social conformity. And I, for, I know for me personally, mm. I feel so much more comfortable when I blend in and I just look like everybody else and nobody has to know that I've got an alcohol free beer. So for me, that's sometimes a really useful thing. But I completely understand that there's also this whole other argument that it's it's um, it's a, it's something that we call a conditioned stimuli, which I know it sounds a bit jargony, but it's a reminder. And um, there's that kind of kind of the taste, the smell, the look. It's a reminder and that can kind of trigger a relapse for some people, and I and I know that um, I know some liver doctors who have very strong views that mm. if you have a history, a, a significant history of alcohol abuse, heavy alcohol abuse, do not go near the zero alcohol alternatives. And actually, maybe maybe you shouldn't even go to the pub for a little while until you feel safe to mm. do so. Um, it's a really difficult one, and there will be some patients who. Um, Feel that it's punitive that they're not even able to have like a zero alcohol beer but I think you just have to share all of these different thoughts with patients and let or people and let them make their, their own yeah. decisions but it's it's a it's a really great question um, and it's a question that I'm sure as, as clinicians we will we will get asked um, um, and it's something to think about carefully Brilliant, really useful discussion on that on that last question. So thanks very much, Ravi, for the question that you sent in. I mean, for me, what I've heard today, it's all about, yes, we understand that these are difficult, challenging situations. It's a time of year that causes additional pressures. Um, we all experience those in our different ways. We all have different coping mechanisms and ways to do it. Sometimes if people have got challenges around alcohol, it, it is about how they've prepared and planned and thought through about what that may bring for them. And I guess that part of that is about making sure that it doesn't just suddenly bring a surprise on you. You're suddenly at that party mm -hmm. and something suddenly uh, the alcohol is flowing and you're bringing part of it. You know how you're going to respond to it. And I think that's a really important message that we want from today. So thank you. And, and that's all we've actually got time for today on the first of our Prairie panels. Um, uh, thanks so much for the panel for, for joining us um, and giving some amazing insights. Although they're absolutely fascinating, some of the discussion that we've had. It's a really complex topic, and I think we need to acknowledge that as well. Um, so if you have enjoyed this uh, discussion today, uh, please like this video. Um, it'll do us a lot of favours in terms of, of making sure that the message around this gets as widely spread as we possibly can. Now, for more of this type of contact from, content from Priory and to get future episodes as soon as they, they drop, please subscribe to this channel. And um, thank you very much for watching. <laughs>